गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम टू गना शॉट गना शॉट में आप सबका स्वागत है वनकम जय हिंद एंड प्रणाम टुडे इवनिंग वी गोन टू टॉक अबाउट राइजिंग टेंशन एंड रॉयलिंग सीज एंड टर्म ऑयल टू वेस्ट इन दिस कासा वेबिनार ओवर द पास्ट थ्री टू फोर मंथ्स द वर्ल्ड इज बॉइलिंग एंड द वर्ल्ड इज बॉइलिंग लाइक वी नवर you know seen it before if you take a global view of the whole story step back you see the conflicts in ukraine west asia is in conflict you look at africa the dotted circle is also known as the ku zone or the sahel portion of the africa it's recorded some innumerable number of coups in the, over the past one year look further east south china sea tensions between philippines and china and the problems between china and taiwan are a flash point just next to us east and west of us the afpac region has its own problems and myanmar is burning and in the middle of all this india is rising and sitting quite <coughs> seemingly snugly but it is not so west asia is in real fire so let's look at west asia which is the subject of our discussion today the israel was as hamas was as hezbollah and syria that compact is on fire from 7th of october and when that happened the world didn't know what hit us then it spread down to the us was a houthi spat over the red sea and the you know shipping lanes there <laughs> that has put a lot of things at risk and i'll just highlight it a minute later of course last but not the least iran has uh, taken off on iraq syria and pakistan with missile attacks and a tit for tat attack between pakistan and uh, iran Notwithstanding all this, Iran-backed militias have been creating problems all over, and there's a huge thing thought that Iran holds a lot of cards in this crisis. <clears throat> With all this happening, India can't keep quiet. We have our own problems. Our shipping lanes are at risk. Our trade lanes are at risk. The IMEC, which was the centerpiece of G20, is also at risk. and so is our relations with many more and not with not un, you know forgetting the fact that china is also around in this area and russia too more importantly you look at it your primary global uh, maritime checkpoints are also at risk why the red sea suez canal compact which is in the center we have seen because of the houthi action you know uh, sea lanes being disrupted go further to the west the panama canal where there is very less water these days has already started a inefficient but alternate land bridge for want of anything else to do this puts all our you know supply chains at risk so not only is there action going around in west asia but our global supply chains are at risk and much more i don't want to take this argument further i'd like our revered panelists to come out with their views so i request each of you to put forth your views in what five to six minutes on what do you feel is the evolving uh, situation in west asia and in the north arabian red sea and the gulf ambassador sajanar sir your view on this whole story which has been going on for the past more than 3 months over to you yeah thank you very much thank you very much general and uh, you know in the 5 or 6 minutes that you have allotted to me what i'm going to do is i'm going to flag two or three issues because there really is no time to go into any great detail or depth in uh, these any of these issues so i'm going to flag uh, a couple of them and then of course uh, depending upon your question and how we take it forward you know the first thing that i would like to speak about is in terms of 
you know, when the uh, conflict started after the 7th of October, when Israel went in, there was that great uh, fear and uh, great apprehension that there might be an expansion of this conflict, that it might go beyond uh, Israel and Hamas, Israel and the Gaza Strip, and it could sort of get more countries also involved. Now, I think that might also have been the thinking of uh, both uh, Hamas as well as Iran. Although I'm not very certain whether Hamas would have taken uh, the green light or the go ahead from Iran before launching its attack on 7th uh, uh, October. My own uh, uh, assessment and my own speaking to people around is that even uh, uh, Iran was taken uh, somewhat by surprise when uh, this uh, attack by Hamas took place. But after that, it has been, I think, trying its very best. Iran has been trying its very best that uh, this uh, uh, conflict should expand. There should be more of a regional uh, uh, conflict. More, more of the Arab countries should also get involved, should also get engaged. And on the other hand, it has been the attempt by the United States and by countries in the West and particularly Israel that it should not get expanded. So what we've seen really is now that it is uh, uh, the Hezbollah has uh, become active, but they have not gone full uh, fledged into the conflict. They have been sort of, you know, sending out, throwing out uh, missiles and drones on uh, Israel, but they have not gone all out as far as attacking Israel is concerned. As far as the Houthis are concerned, I think they have been engaging in this, of course, with the encouragement of Iran, both Hezbollah and Houthis, because they think that, you know, if uh, they are into it, maybe some of the other states will also get involved. But I don't think any of the Arab states, not uh, uh, Egypt, uh, not uh, Saudi Arabia, not UAE, not uh, Syria, no one is keen to get uh, involved in this. So that is why, in spite of uh, what you saw in terms of the demonstrations of the Arab streets, we have not seen any uh, significant expansion as far as the conflict is concerned. I think as far as the Houthis are concerned, I'll not uh, spend time on Hezbollah, but I think as far as Houthis are concerned, because that is also a matter of considerable concern as far as India is concerned. So they have basically, you know, uh, they don't enjoy any global legitimacy. They uh, Want, they also have been having problems, although the war has been going on for the last 10 years. They have been in control over the last 10 years, but uh, they have really not been able to provide even the most fundamental basic services to the people in Yemen. So I think they have found this uh, as a good uh, uh, a ploy by sort of, you know, uh, hitting out at uh, ships. It uh, provides them with some support both domestically from Yemen as also from uh, the Arab states uh, who they, uh, because the Houthis claim that they are also fighting for the interest of uh, Palestinians. Although the shipping that they have been uh, attacking is uh, not uh, only Israeli shipping. Uh, there are so many other ships also that have uh, been affected. So I think the total impact of what the Houthis are doing uh, as you mentioned, there is a you know supply chain uh, disruption because all the elements that are to go, the intermediate goods, products, they are not reaching on time. There is uh, more than three times in terms of the insurance cost that has increased. What earlier used to be about 0.6% of the value of the cargo, today it has become more than 2%. So it is uh, more than three times that it has increased. So I think as far as the economy, which was still suffering from uh, COVID-19 and the Russia-Ukraine conflict, that has also suffered as a result of this. Now, uh, you know, one or two comments that were made that, uh, 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 that as far as uh, Israel is concerned, that they will not be able to completely eradicate. I think we've seen other examples. You know, it is like terrorism. If you can't, meaning, and you might call terrorism also as an ideology, 
if you can't uh, deal with terrorism, if you can't completely eradicate it, it doesn't mean that you agree to live with it. I think we have seen the, uh, the, uh, uh, how the Islamic State has been dealt with. And I think it has been dealt with quite effectively. So I think it is something similar as far as Hamas is concerned. And if it's Hamas is using human shields, common people as human shields, I think there have to be ways that have to be devised. The last point that I would like to flag now is on uh, as far as India is concerned. I think India has been very clear that we stand against terrorism. The fact that we are uh, fully in support of all the hostages being released. And uh, I think we have been handling our uh, uh, the approach has been extremely strategic and appropriate, whether it is in terms of our pronouncement, whether it is in terms of the positions that we have taken in the General Assembly. And I'd be very happy to discuss that if there is a, a question on that. Uh, also, as far as, uh, you know, and I think uh, we have been able to maintain our very close linkages with our partners in uh, uh, West Asia and the Middle East. And uh, that is very well demonstrated by the fact that we had the a very successful visit of uh, Sultan Haitham from Oman. We had the visit of uh, the uh, President of the United Arab Emirates. We had uh, the invitation to uh, our uh, uh, minister, uh, Mrs. Smriti Irani, to visit Saudi Arabia and to go to Medina. So I think uh, one can say that our uh, relations with the uh, West Asian countries continue to be robust and strong and dynamic as they were. Our external affairs minister has gone to, had gone to uh, Iran. Basically, again, I think it was uh, to uh, deal with, uh, to confer with them as to how this Houthi issue can be dealt with as far as our own shipment, as far as our own shipping is concerned. So I think India is uh, handling it well. India is dealing uh, with it uh, well. Our partnership, our strategic partnership with Israel remains strong and also with the, the other countries, it remains strong. So let me finish here and then I'll look forward to questions from you and from the uh, audience. Thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. I think you made some very important points which I'd like to reinforce. <clears throat> First, expansion of conflict. You made a very important point. <laughs> Hardly anyone in this whole story, except probably Hamas, wants this conflict to expand beyond a point. But if I draw a parallel between what happened before the Second First World War, when that assassination took place in Sarajevo, the Archduke Ferdinand was killed. It was an insignificant event by itself. But it set off a domino <laughs> of ethics which resulted in the First World War. <clears throat> and it was a long-drawn affair. We're just 100 days into this war. And that's why I showed the first map of a larger conflict which is happening and a focus here. But then, that is future, and we'll talk about it a little later. The second point, and I think the most important point you made in your entire intervention, is that just because you cannot completely destroy an ideology, you cannot agree to live with terrorism or such an ideology. No nation can do that. If we can understand this, after all, we've also not, India also, ever since we got our independence, we have refused to live with such a violent ideology or a separatist ideology under any conditions. After all, uh, our separatists and Kashmir have taken a lot of ideas from these very Hamas and Hezbollah kind of uh, you know, outfits. I think it's a very important point. And then, of course, you highlighted India's stands out, on which I'll get back to. But Iran has played a hand from behind through its you know, proxies. And uh, though it uh, apparently it feels that you know Iran doesn't want to enlarge this conflict, but it is pushing the envelope of the conflict simultaneously. Iran today holds the cards to the Strait of Hormuz 
and the Gulf of Aden and the Babel Mandab, which is the Gulf of Tears. It is also buying for the Islamic leadership and closing Suez also closes and promotes Iran's case for leadership of the Muslim world. If this be so, I just stated a few issues. How do you see this whole story going and what role Iran will play and how do you probably contain Iran and what would be India's stance in it is a question which I think has to be solved diplomatically first. And I don't think there are any military solutions to this. So, Ambassador, sir, we'd like your views on this naughty problem called or the shadowy power called Iran. All yours. And of course, what you wanted to say about India, I would like you to uh, you know, put across. Okay. Thank you very much, General. I think that's a very uh, relevant question. That's a very valid question. Because uh, you're very right, I think. Uh, uh, and I agree also with uh, Admiral uh, Anil Chopra when he said, you know, that there are many contenders for uh, leadership as far as the region is concerned. Although one of them, I would like to strike them off. You know, he mentioned also Pakistan. I agree, Turkey, Iran, and uh, Saudi Arabia. I don't think uh, uh, Pakistan is in the same league. You mentioned about Pakistan. Maybe, I don't know whether it was a slip of your tongue or... Because I don't think anyone in this group will uh, sort of, you know, or those who are sort of, you know, listening, they will put Pakistan in the same league. Not at all. So I think Pakistan is uh, has its own problems. Let's not discuss it uh, here because neither do we have the time nor, uh, you know, we need to... Uh, expend that effort in this session. But Iran, yes. And Iran has uh, the wherewithal. Iran has, you know, the civilizational sort of, uh, you know, uh, strength going back. In, uh, Iran has the numbers. Iran has the resources. Now, also, uh, you know, coming to another uh, point uh, that General you made and that I think Admiral also made in terms of the relevance and importance of China. But I think China has really been able to bring Saudi Arabia and Iran together to an extent. Although, you know, meaning our friends from the Muslim world, they, you know, earlier they were saying, you know, Shias and Sunnis, they will not be able to come uh, together. But I think what they have seen is uh, that uh, strategically, at least in terms of short term measures, what is important for them. They have at least uh, uh, made an effort to bury the hatchet for the time being. That having been said, uh, and that is why you would see that while Iran has been trying to instigate, you know, basically the Arab street and all the countries that they need to rise up in uh, favor of the Palestinian cause, etc. Not one of them, you know, they have uh, uh, given uh, uh, some sort of uh, credence and some sort of taken on board what the Arab street has been demonstrating, but they have not taken the bait and gone in and uh, tried to sort of you know, put even greater pressure except for speaking out. In concrete terms, they have not done anything as far as this is concerned. So this, uh, I think uh, Iran will continue to try and uh, we did not discuss uh, Iran's attacks in uh, Iraq, Syria and Pakistan because there's been no time. So Iran will try to expand the uh, orbit, expand the, uh, you know, the, the, the range, the uh, expanse of this uh, uh, conflict. But I don't think it is going to be successful. And in that, it is definitely not going to get any support from Saudi Arabia because what is being challenged is uh, the Saudi Arabian uh, position, influence. And uh, that is uh, uh, Turkey or Turkey also might uh, attempt to do that. Uh, but uh, I think uh, Saudi Arabia will try to stick on as far as its own position of authority is concerned. As far as India is concerned, uh, we know that, uh, you know, there is a certain hierarchy of our uh, relations with these countries. Uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, they are much more important than Iran is. And I just, uh, you know, at the end, I'll just uh, like to draw your attention to the fact that when in 2018, Mr. Trump said that there are sanctions on Iranian oil 
don't purchase oil from Iran. India uh, did not demur, meaning we did argue with uh, them. We did try to put our view forward as we had done. If you recall in 2011, when Obama and Hillary Clinton were in office and we were able to get a, 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 you know, a, a waiver from that. But when with Mr. Trump, it was not possible. We stopped importing oil. We didn't do the same as far as Russia is concerned, as far as the Russia-Ukraine conflict is concerned. So I think we need to recognize also as to how we place, how we look at our own relations as far as Iran is concerned. These are important relations. These are strategic partnerships, but they go only up to a point. And I think our relations with other countries in uh, uh, the Gulf, UAE, Saudi Arabia, etc., they are much more significant. Israel, for that matter, they are much more significant, much more important than the importance that we attach to our relations with Iran. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. I think you put the whole thing in perspective. Uh, our relationship with Iran is just not Iran-India relations. It has an impact on the global relations, India and the world, India and the you know Muslim world, India and our oil producing or, or oil sourcing world, and India and the larger West. So it's a multi-layered thing. And with Iran, uh, it's a fact that we've had a relationship going back in ages. Also, it's a broken relationship in terms of, you know, on and off kind of a relationship we've had at the behest of others. So we're going to have a tough time with this. I have no doubts about it. So we are in Shabahar, we've not made, you know, headway in Shabahar. So there are many factors to it. But what I wanted to bring forth is that Iran is something you can't ignore. You have to pay special attention to it. You have to operate with Iran in white, gray, and black all together at the same time. And that's a quite a diplomatic trapeze which we have to be up to. The military option is far over the horizon. 